Welcome back to the Million Dollar Tipping Point podcast. Today, our guest is Jessica Schreiman, and she has a law practice focused on business and intellectual property and serves as general counsel to startup companies, local businesses, and nonprofits and creatives. What's fun is that I actually have not had anyone on my show who's had a law practice, which is crazy. I thought, and I didn't even know this. I was like, my VA told me this. She does research on the guests and she helps me out researching you. Um, and she said, hey, we've never had someone with a law practice. And I said, really? And I looked through and I was like, you're right. I can't believe this. I've been doing this over a year and I've not had any anyone with a law practice. So welcome. Yeah. Thank you. You're going to be the first. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> exciting. Thank you. So today we're not only going to be obviously getting advice from you on how to grow a business to seven figures, but for our audience, I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about what is intellectual property in your business and how is it important for any business owner? A little bit about being a first generation American as your parents are from Russia and maybe how that affected your work ethic and what you do mm -hmm. and how to work with a managing attorney or a manager effectively. So don't forget for our audience, have you downloaded the Money Mapper yet? The link is at the bottom of the show notes and you can use this plug and play worksheet that will help you discover financial independence as a business owner. So again, welcome. Let's just jump right in. Tell us a little bit about your business and your law firm right now. Yeah, definitely. So Schreitman Law, as you mentioned, is a business and intellectual property law firm. Our mission is to transform entrepreneurs and creatives into badass business owners. So we really help guide them in a few ways on the general counsel side, just strategizing and executing on plans, making sure they're doing things properly and effectively and efficiently. And because we work a lot with, as you mentioned, startups and creatives, a lot of the value and the assets in their business come from intellectual property, whether it's creations that they're making or like software that they're coding. And so literally half of our practice and our business is focused on protecting and enforcing their intellectual property, their business assets. Why do you suggest to business owners that they need to get a lawyer involved to protect? Is this something that should I mean, protect intellectual property? Is this something that should happen in the beginning or is it something that only happens when someone steals your stuff? <laughs> totally not when someone steals your stuff. There are so many precautions that you can take um, before you get to an oh crap moment. Um, and different intellectual property comes in different forms. So there's the most common ones that people recognize are trademarks, copyrights, and patents. And each of those kind of have different points at which it becomes very advisable to start protecting. Like with patents, you there is a public disclosure. So you have to file for a patent within a certain period of time of disclosing any portion of it publicly before it becomes part of the public domain, if you haven't already established your rights to it. Trademarks, which protect things like brand names, logos, slogans, things like that. We tell clients the sooner, the better, um, because if you think about it, how much money businesses, small businesses, entrepreneurs, even big businesses, how much money they invest in building their brand recognition, developing their reputation, um, investing into their marketing, their domain names, their, their logos, you know, all of that stuff. And if you don't know whether you even can own that trademark, that brand name, whatever it is, then you're potentially spending thousands, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars um, investing in something that you don't even know you can protect, you can own, or you can get a return on that investment. So we always counsel clients like the sooner, the better with that sort of stuff. So I have a question then, if you yeah. don't mind me interrupting, because no, I looked into trademarking and that stuff. I have a whole section in my course on it. What happens when you want to trademark something that is very like a generic and name almost like so many people can have it. Like if you type in a word like start or coffee or something like that, you'll see tons and tons and tons of stuff under the trademark registry. So, yes. I, and tons of people might have the same thing. It looks like two at times. So how, how do you get that trademarked when you might have something that's very, I don't want to say unoriginal, but something that uses common yeah. words that other people have. 
Totally. And your use of the word generic is very on point. Um, it sounds like you might have some, some knowledge and experience with trademarks. So trademark protection, there are two major components of what makes something trademark make trademarkable. And there's also a range of how strong trademark protections are based on those eligibility criteria. Um, so marks that are generic and that kind of directly refer to the good or the service that it's meant to refer to are very, very weak marks and often are not protectable. So coffee is a great example. Um, just to use one we're probably all familiar with. So like Starbucks coffee, for example, if you look at their trademark, the word coffee is actually disclaimed. So that means that Starbucks doesn't own the word coffee and they can't stop others from using the word coffee. What they have protected is the entirety of the mark Starbucks coffee. Um, or they may have a registration just for Starbucks without even including the word coffee. So if you wanted to start a coffee company and call it like best coffee, most likely you're you're not going to get a registration. And if in some world you are able to get it, it's going to be a very weak mark because you won't be able to stop other people from saying that they have the best coffee mm -hmm. because these are generic words that apply directly to the product that you're selling. I read a story once that Taylor Swift uh, trademarked Shake It Off from her song, which I thought was weird. Like, how can you trademark the phrase shake it off. Okay, again, I don't remember if this is true or not. So take that with a grain of salt, but let's pretend it is. Because like so many people say, well, just shake it off. So why would someone want to trademark something that is so popular and like in everyday usage? So I wonder if she has that trademarked or whether she has it copyright protected. Mm, as yeah, maybe that was it. She might have it copyright protected as the title of the song, um, which kind of like, Anybody can name a song, shake it off. Um, she probably doesn't, I would be surprised, and, and I'll look into this after our call, I would be surprised if she just has the title copy written. She probably has the entire song copy mm. written, which would prevent others from replicating or copying her song kind of word for word. Um, okay. But just to bring the analogy to the, to the trademark side, because you asked, you know, you see so many trademarks that, are the same or that are very similar. So trademarks, they attach to a specific good or service. So let's say that you are a cleaning service or like a dusting service called shake it off, like shake off the dust. Right. Your trademark isn't a general trademark that you are claiming to use for your podcast services. No, it's specifically for your cleaning services. So let's say that I am starting a um, like a clothing recycling company. And I'm saying, shake it off, like shake off the old clothes and get something new. Those are completely different services. And so we may both be able to use a similar mark because somebody who's looking for cleaning service isn't going to come across my clothing recycling company and confuse it with yours. Okay. That makes sense because I think the, I actually think what I looked up was like the source or something. Cause there's a lot of stuff out there called the source, right. And a lot of businesses use it. And I was like looking that up in the trademark while I was doing my research for my course. And I was like, man, there's like a million of these, like not a million, it was probably, but quite a bit. So I was like, how can people trademark the same thing over and over again? So it's like, you have to yeah. start getting really specific. You're saying with the trademark, that's going to be something very different from someone else. So if there is someone who had something called the source, and it was exactly the same business as someone else who had the source. And they would not be allowed to be trademarked together. There would be a decline. Most right? likely not. Unless they come to some sort of agreement amongst themselves. But even then, because ultimately the trademark office, their role is to protect consumers. And the whole point about trademarks, actually source is exactly what it's about. It's about... Um, avoiding confusion amongst consumers about the source of the goods and services that they're receiving. So most likely, even if two businesses were like, ah, you're in California, I'm in Florida, we both want to use the source, okay, no problem. Most likely the trademark office is going to say, it's the same exact service, it's the same exact mark, there's going to be a likelihood that consumers are going to get confused, and therefore we can't allow it. Mm. 
What made you decide to focus in this specific area of law? Oh, man. Uh, So I, you had mentioned, you know, me being a first generation um, American. So I always wanted to go to art school. I I was really into the visual arts, um, graphic design and fashion design. My newly immigrated Russian parents were like, you will not go to art school. Don't be ridiculous. (laughs) And so long story short, I ended up, you know, going to an academic university and going to law school. But I knew that if I were to be in this world, I wanted to work with entrepreneurs and creatives. And because I've always loved design and and I've always been a very visual person, like I've always loved signage and fonts and things like that. And, And I just came to learn, you know, that trademarking is really how companies hold themselves out oftentimes visually um, and are able to, you know, generate consumer bases and reputation um, based on those. And, and um, it just kind of happened that, you know, it was one element of, of art in a way that, that I could be involved in. I love that you still tied it in. Do you do anything art related still? Do you draw or paint? Or- Personally, I, yeah. I try. Yeah, I, I try to um, to spend a few minutes in the in the quiet morning practicing some hand lettering or something like that. Um, I, I try. But these days, running a business, um, definitely, you know, some of those early morning pleasures are, you know, not an everyday habit, unfortunately. No, no I know what you mean. What are some of the most common businesses that you work with? Um, I noticed on your website, you said you've worked with cannabis industry businesses, and I thought that was kind of cool. Um, anything we, else that's like more common than others? Yeah. So we definitely have a lot of early stage startup companies. Um, the first job that I had out of law school was with another boutique firm that specialized in that. Um, and I excelled at, um, negotiating and kind of structuring businesses and helping people figure out their relationships with their partners and things like that. So that has kind of carried on. Um, and in the past few years, since business has gotten to a comfortable place that I could start exploring and pursuing more of, of what really thrills me, we've really focused on, on in the creative space. So we now have a wonderful ledger of marketing agencies, artists, photographers, um, some musicians and, and poets, like a lot with creatives and also creative organizations. So we actually um, I officially represent the local art and science museum and um and a few other really awesome organizations so that's been a lot of fun as someone who has the bar in who passed the bar in florida no mm-hmm. excuse me if i butcher anything because i don't know yeah. much about law but you pass the bar in florida can you only work with florida companies then or can you work with or they have to be registered in florida but they can they be located somewhere yeah. else So the wonderful nuance about copyrights, patents, and trademarks is that they are regulated federally. So Mm -hmm. we actually do have clients all over the U.S. for for that. When it comes to the corporate side, we are limited to the states where we are licensed. Thankfully, the team has expanded and we are now able to represent clients in, in a few states, California, Massachusetts, Florida, um, fingers crossed, hopefully soon, Tennessee as well, and um, and New York. So little by little, as we're growing, we're, you know, I'm not going to say we're a national law firm, but we're starting to, you know, to plant some seeds in, in other states as well. I'm in Massachusetts, so that was very cool to hear. Amazing. <laughs> Our managing attorney is, um, is um, right outside Boston. I saw that in her bio. Actually, not that she was outside Boston, but I saw that she went to a Boston area school. Yes. And so I was like, yeah, oh, fun, fun connection. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, your journey when you're younger. You said a little bit about, you know, you wanted to go into art school. I would, I was hoping to learn a little bit more about the being a first generation American and how that affected your work ethic with your parents. Because with people I've interviewed who are first generation Americans, they often have a very different work ethic. Not saying like anything good or bad. Mm-hmm. It's just very sure. different in how they come to where they are. So if you could share a little bit of that with us, that would be very interesting. 
Yeah, definitely. So I will say that growing up, I didn't appreciate it as much as an adult and, and seeing where I'm at and, and knowing that I probably wouldn't have gotten here if not for some of the ways that I was brought up. I'm, I'm very thankful. So we, um, you know, came to America, you know, not so much like seeking a better life. I'll just put it that way. And when my family was moving, they had to, like many immigrants, had to leave like all of their possessions behind and, and kind of start from scratch. And my parents were definitely on, um, you know, dependent on, on government assistance when they first came to America the first few years. So they had to work their butts off to support the family and to be able to move out of like public housing into a home that they own themselves. And so when I was brought up, my job was to study and to get good grades and, um, and, and that, that was my job, um, which I, I did. Um, and it wasn't really an option and it oftentimes led to fights because, you know, I wanted to go to parties and have a social life, but couldn't do anything until I did all of my homework and my homework was checked every night. And now I laugh about it, but like math is, is the one thing, like every night after dinner, my father would check my math homework. And for every question I got wrong, he would make me do three more of like that type of question. So oftentimes, you know, there was a lot of studying basically. Um, and, um, and just kind of like that sort of like focus and discipline and, and learning that like things have to be nearly perfect has, has definitely followed me throughout my life to the point that as a manager of other people, sometimes I have to step back and remind myself not to, not to expect unreasonable things and, and to remember, you know, that everybody makes mistakes and, and um, just to give a little more grace sometimes. So when you say as a manager, you've had to step back and not expect unreasonable things. Is that because you're saying like, you feel like the way you were brought up, sometimes the expectations oh, were unrealistic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of my like anecdotes is, um, I came home one day from school and dad, I love you. I'm going to tease you for this right now. But I came home from school one day with a math test and I was like, dad, look, I got a 95. And his first response was, why not a hundred? And I was like, damn it. I just want you to be happy. So, you know, and, and you know, that, that stays with you. So yeah, exactly. And then he made you do that one problem you got wrong three times in different format. <laughs> Yeah. I had my dad, um, he, I don't think he did that with math, but he did with spelling. So I just remember every time I got a word spelled wrong on a quiz or test in third grade and fourth grade, probably fifth grade too, I had to spell that word 10 times. Mm. And then, and I saw this, this memory in my head of Buffalo and writing Buffalo 10 times because I spelled it with an E. And now I know I spell it with an A. <laughs> no. And that is, I mean, it's kind of like something it's good, but I wonder if it's a lost art because the computer and text messages change everything for you. Yeah, but yeah, sure. so you so you obviously mentioned about your managing and how that that was affected by your past. But what do you think are some of the biggest challenges you've had hiring? Hiring. So hiring is tricky. Um, you really have to be. I have learned that I have to be really careful in not getting caught up in a good interview because some people interview really well you know they're very impressive especially people that so my hiring philosophy for for um for some of the positions that i've been hiring recently are to find somebody more experienced than i am and in that process when you are interviewing with somebody who has you know in, in a few of my cases, like 20 years more experience than, than you have, um, it's easy to be very impressed with the experience that these people have had. 
Um, and what I have had to learn is just not to get wrapped up in that and to have a hiring plan and to have criteria and to stick to it even when somebody seems like amazing in an interview. Um, mm -hmm. That's been my biggest lesson recently. And also to take your time. And I know it's hard because um, also like what happened in my case, sometimes you need somebody like right away and that can kind of overshadow or like blind you to making the right choice because you're kind of rushed and under pressure. Hmm. I've heard a lot higher, higher, slow, fire fast. Fire That's fast. One of the, a common theme yeah. in this, in this podcast and the yeah. interviews. So how do you work with another manager effectively? Your managing attorney that we briefly mentioned who went to school in Boston or around Boston. Um, how, how do you work with her effectively and make sure that there's not too many conflicts in the way you guys manage? Yeah. So it's a very timely question. Um, so Diane and I have known each other for almost five years now, and we've worked on projects together as colleagues over the years. Um, she recently joined our team. It was um, in May. She joined our team as our managing attorney of copyrights and, and trademarks. And we all be, you know, totally candid that for the first time we are having a little bit of conflict, like things, things have been going great and, and things will be great. Um, but for the first time we're facing a little bit of conflict and, um, and that can be difficult because my, approach and my philosophy and what I'm trying to accomplish with this law firm, almost more importantly than the work we do for our clients is the environment that I am creating for the team that is trusting me with their time. Um, because we spend a lot of our time at work and, and I do believe that we can be happy with our work and with our team and all of that. So for me, what's challenging is, is, and also being still a relatively young and relatively new manager is being able to step into that role fully and to know when what's being called for is me being a manager or me being a colleague or whether me being a friend. It's a lot to kind of like shift back and forth with like moment to moment. Um, and and also just the communication, just like with everything and also trust and autonomy. I think that that's really something like when I brought Diane on, I knew that I could trust her. I wouldn't have to like, oh, you know, watch over her shoulder, micromanage any of that. And I know that she loves that freedom um, to, to run her team as, as she sees fit. So it's kind of all of that. I, I feel like it's such a timely question because I'm like in the thick of it right now. Um, learning. The so we'll check in in like three months. So. <laughs> yes, please. yes, absolutely. How is it going? What are lessons you've learned? <laughs> Do you think your leadership and management style has changed over the years? I mean, I, you did mention that, you know, you were, you were expecting maybe unreasonable things in the beginning, but other than that, how do you think it's changed as you've grown your business? I think what I have learned is it's a lot more difficult than I ever thought it would be. And learning that there is really a big difference between being a leader and being a manager. And I think what I have recently learned is that I don't want to be a manager. <laughs> I, I want someone who, who is great at that so that they can be the manager and, and I can be the leader and the colleague um, because, because it's, it's tough and they're very, they're, they call for very different needs and skills and um, it's, it's hard. It's a lot. I've heard that quite a few times. And some of me was wonders if I should take that question and just kind of like tweak it. So it's just like, how have your leadership changed over the years and how has your management yeah. changed over the years? Um, 
because a lot of people say to me like, oh, it's just so different though. One is like, you know, task oriented and like very much like, are you getting everything? Is everything on time? Is everything getting done correctly, et cetera. And one is very different. Like leadership is very different. And it's hard. Um, How do you even learn that? Like, how, have you just been learning as you go? Because I've heard a lot of people talk about like, you know, you don't get trained for this. You don't get trained to be a great manager, a great leader and run this company. It's very tactical. If you go to business school, it's so tactical. It's not really about leadership. So how did you, mm -hmm. is it just been like, have you been reading any books? Have you been listening to podcasts? Have you been, what have you been doing to grow that aspect? That, of yes. I also, and I think I kind of just like realized it organically that I was like, oh man, like I have to do this and I also have to do this. And these are very different things. And then it was kind of like an aha moment. I was like, oh, there's a difference between being a leader and being a manager. Um, and so definitely like these days, a lot of like, I haven't read too much poetry recently. I'm reading a lot more like leadership and management books so that I can improve because you're right. Like it's not something that I've been exactly trained in. Um, and so I know I'm bound to make mistakes and I know that, I mean, I'm the type of person that I will never think I've mastered something completely. I will always be able to learn something new. Um, so recently the book I'm reading right now actually is called first time manager, um, which was recommended to me by, by my practice advisor. So that, that is something I, I would say is having people, again, people that are more experienced and that are smarter than you, um, not only within the business, but also kind of like ancillary to the business. So I definitely have, you know, I have a fractional CFO that I work with. I have a fractional CEO that I work with and I have kind of a, almost like a, like an executive slash business coach because there's so much I don't know. Um, and, and that book first time manager was recommended to me and, and I've gotten a lot of, practical and useful um, lessons out of it. I highly recommend that book. Good. We'll put it in the, the show notes. You just mentioned you work with a fractional, you work with a fractional CEO. So that's interesting. So then how does that role fit into your firm? So right now it's in an advisory capacity because I really am the CEO of, of the company. Um, but again, you know, and and I'm still relatively young, right? Like I'm, you know, I, I don't have 30 years of experience as an executive. So I can't even imagine what I don't know. And I, so I, I've been in sports since I was really young. And so I'm very accustomed to like having trainers and having coaches and things like that. And pretty early on, once I started the firm, I think I was like, I need somebody who actually knows about this to help me figure all of this out. Um, and I've been, you know, really fortunate that I can, can have that resource. Um, cause I do, I, I lean on them quite a bit to help me figure things out. Do you, would you say that's one of the best investments you've made as having a coach? Um, yes, in the sense that what I have in, the best investment I have made has been the investment back into myself and into the business, just like reinvesting and, and learning. So in that sense, I would say it's definitely up there. Yeah. What do you think is one of the worst investments you've ever made? Ooh, definitely a hire that I made a terrible hire that I made that cost me a lot of money and three very good clients um, and a bit of sanity while I was on my honeymoon, unfortunately. Oh no, oh no. <laughs> that was probably my worst investment. Um, Why is it always like that? Why can't people just let you have a vacation in peace, especially your honeymoon, right? I feel like this happens often. <laughs> I mean, thankfully I was able to like chop it down real fast because I had like zero tolerance on, on my honeymoon. I worked my butt off in order to be able to take a two week vacation. And when this person really started causing problems in my absence and it was brought to my attention that he was taking advantage of people in my absence, I fired him immediately and just told the clients, you know, I'll be back next week. Like just hang on and, and I'll get all of this cleaned up and sorted out for you which I did, but ultimately it still, it still cost us business. Um, what did you learn from that specifically? Like, has that changed your hiring process then? 
Completely, completely. After that, I was like, I don't care what a person's resume says. I don't care how much experience they have. I don't care how well they interview. I'm still going to ask for writing samples. I'm still going to um, have like, um, like an, I call it an introductory period where we do a few projects together. I'm going to make sure that I honor the, the training program that I've put into place. I'm going to put a training program into place. I'm going to check references, like everything that I said in the beginning, like I'm going to stick to the policies that we have, regardless of, you know, how great somebody seems in, in an interview. Mm. And also, and I think my office manager would be screaming this is to trust your gut because pretty much from the very, very beginning, even before I hired him, I said to her, I was like, something feels a little off about this guy. And then a couple of times throughout those first few months that we were working together, I was like, something just doesn't feel right. But again, I was like, but he has so much experience and this and that. And ultimately my, my gut was right. And, and I should have listened. And then your honeymoon. Oh, that makes me so sad. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. I will say, you know, there was one day of, of inconvenience in, in two weeks. So, you know, it, it wasn't overwhelming. Yeah. What do you think is the most important action item you took to grow your business to seven figures, even from six figures to seven figures? Definitely hiring and knowing, and, and this is something I'll say this kind of vicariously through all of the entrepreneurs that we have worked with, is that it can be difficult for people to let go. It can be difficult for people to trust other people to, we will never, I think as, as the business owners, we will always feel like nobody will care as much as we do and therefore nobody will do as good a job as we will but we have to we we have to be able to let go even when that means like maybe you know some mistakes being made or something like that like we can't do it all alone and honestly i certainly don't envy any entrepreneur who tries to do it all on their own it's lonely it's difficult and it's just a lot more fun to surround yourself with people that you enjoy and, and that you admire and you get to all work on this thing together. So mm -hmm. definitely, I, I made my first hire. I thought it would take me like a year before I needed somebody, but I made my first hire within like three months. Oh, um, wow. And definitely, you know, not always perfectly, but for sure having a team and having people to help and, just having people to spend time with for me is, is the best part. Mm. So what can you share with us, if this is possible, a time when a client or a customer was unhappy and how did you rectify that? So thankfully, knock on wood, I don't think it has happened too often because we really will go to the moon for our clients um, but so, for example, um, you know, we had this situation with this attorney that we had hired who was not meeting our expectations, was not meeting the client expectations, and things were going downhill very quickly. And granted, in, in one of these instances, the client, the client was a bit unfocused and disorganized, I will say, which can make our job difficult. Um, but at the end of the day, our job is to help the client accomplish their goals. Sometimes that requires giving an opinion or an assessment that isn't what the client wants to hear, but knowing that it's what they need to hear in order to get out of the mess that they're in or accomplish the goal that they want. Um, in one of these instances, the client like really pushed back and really just didn't want to listen. And, and unfortunately in that situation, it did get to a point that we weren't able to do our job effectively. And we did have to advise the client, you know, like, Hey, 
we're happy to finish this scope of work, but unfortunately, we don't think we're going to be able to help you accomplish your goals effectively. And we think it's probably better for you to, you know, find somebody else more suitable. Um, also, because in, in that case, it was ending up costing the client a lot more money than if they would have just listened to us. Um, and, and that client didn't have a ton of money. He was actually in debt and, and facing some unhappy investors. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to just take people's money. I want to help them accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and, but the, but my approach, regardless of what's going on is always to maintain composure and be professional and, and, know that my job is to give sound advice regardless of you know <clears throat> how how it might be received or whether it's what the client wants to hear so you know just being being honest and again like maintaining the professionalism because that's one thing i think nobody can say is that we have been disrespectful or, or anything like that. That to me is very important. Have you, similar to the hiring, have you put anything in place that helps you weed out clients that might be not a good match for your firm? We have, and thankfully it's been a while since we've brought on a client that turned out to, to not be a very good client. Um, and we have been able to define our ideal client based on some of the not ideal, right? You're not ideal. client. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we do take our time in the introduction and, and allowing not only for the client to vet us, but for us to vet them. And the things we're looking for are their communication styles. Like, are they responsive or do they say they need something right away? And then, when we deliver on it, then we don't hear from them for weeks. Uh, that indicates, you know, an inconsistency and also a misalignment in expectations and reciprocity. One of our values is reciprocity. We give everything and, and we do expect something in, in return. You know, we need our clients to be respectful. We need them to be communicative. Um, and also we need them to trust us. We have had a couple of clients that, for whatever reason, um, didn't trust us, which made us question, like, why did you hire us in the first place? Um, and it also interfered with us being able to do our jobs effectively. So we, we know what doesn't work. And so when we get inklings of that in in the beginning stages as we're doing introductions and things like that and having some initial communications, then we, we tend to avoid bringing those people on. How do you tell them that you're not going to bring them on? So, I mean, sometimes it's an outright, it, okay. So for example, we had a potential client last, last, or a couple weeks ago, last month, and he wanted to talk to an attorney immediately about some situation that he was having said, okay, no problem. Can you please tell us a bit more so that we can schedule properly so that we're informed so that we can be prepared to have a, a conversation with you. And he was very demanding. You know, he insisted like on speaking before providing any information, despite us reassuring him that everything is confidential, you know, it, all of the, we have very strict rules on that as attorneys. And he refused. He said, no, I, I want to, I want to call. And we just said, you know, unfortunately that's not our policy and, and we need to receive some information in order to, to get this scheduled and, and we let him go. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we will, you know, just outright tell us it, when we get to the point that we are having like an introductory consultation, which is how we refer to it. Um, and, and something seems off, especially in business. There have been a few potential clients that we weren't 
too thrilled on what their business model was and what it seemed like they were looking to accomplish. And in that situation, we told them, you know, unfortunately, we don't think our values are aligned and, and therefore are unfortunately can't represent you in this matter. So I just, just tell people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about that question though, because I had a cohort the other day where we had to talk about like, what if you don't like the client? Like, how do you tell them? And I'm like, it's not that hard. Once you do the first one, it gets easier, but well, like, it's hard for people. Cause they're like, I don't want to turn down money. I mean, these people are, are that's way beginners, valid. but yeah, that's super it's, valid. It's hard. It's hard, but once you do the first one and when you get, it gets easier and then you're like, I know this is You know, it's not like you're saying, I don't like you, you know, you can say it more diplomatically. Like you can even, if you, if you don't want to say anything that's indicative of it, you can simply say, I don't think I'm the best person to assist you. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. it. You don't have to tell them why. Yep. Setting boundaries, setting boundaries is so important. Yeah. Um, so where do you see your business going in like, let's say the next three years? Oh my goodness. In three years, I hope that we have a managing attorney for our corporate practice, which is what I'm currently hiring for. In three years, I hope that we have a patent attorney and a either a mediator or a litigator in-house full time on the team. And I hope that each of those teams have a whole support structure and that it's not just, you know, an individual attorney doing all the work. In three years, I also hope that we have a full-time in-house marketing and or business development expert. And in three years, I certainly hope that we are established in Tennessee um, and potentially pursuing um, um being able, getting licensed in in other states as well. Have you faced any hurdles specifically as a woman when you've been trying to grow your business? Mm -hmm. That's such an important question. Um, I had one scenario. I was the attorney representing an early stage um, medical device company And I was not only the youngest person, I was also the only woman. There was one other woman involved, um, but she terminated her relationship with the company in the middle of this private equity financing that we were doing. And it was it was a few million dollars. It was sub 10, but it was a few million dollars. And it was me on the one side and a a large firm, a big firm on the other side. And I was the only female and it all got done, but it was my least favorite project that I had worked on. Everybody was very demanding. And actually there were a few things that didn't go correctly and Somehow it was painted as though it was my fault when I knew exactly who was the cause of it, but somehow it was painted as though I had messed something up. Like I was taking a long time on something, but the reason I was taking a long time was because I was having to clean up like terribly written language and very important investment documents. Um, so it was it was definitely. a a unique experience for me. And and when I walked away at the end of it, just kind of feeling like I had gotten dragged through the mud, that's when it kind of dawned on me that I was the only female. And it definitely crossed my mind if I had been a male, if I would have been treated the same way. I'll never know, but, um, but it, it definitely had a, had a certain feel to it that left me feeling icky at the end of it. Well, trust your gut, right? That's what you yeah. said earlier. So yeah. Yeah. probably, maybe. I know yeah. you can't say for sure. You can't say for sure. Yeah, you're right though. Yeah. So what what advice do you have for other women who are trying to grow their business to seven figures? And why do you think maybe some women fail or hit roadblocks and don't make it? Um, Because it can be scary. Um, there, it's a lot of responsibility. And when you are, particularly if you are a woman who 
already has a lot of responsibility, whether it's domestic responsibility, family responsibility, responsibility to older generations, parents, things like that. It's a whole lot more responsibility. Um, and not that that's a reason not to pursue it, but just make sure that you do have boundaries and that you do stick to it. I, I talk about boundaries a lot um, with my team. Actually, there's another, if you like book recommendations, it's called, um, this isn't exactly correct, but it's something like set boundaries, find peace. And um, that, that book was, was very enlightening for me. And the most important boundary for me, and I know that, that you always like hearing about people's like mottos. My motto when I started the business was we build work around life and not life around work. And the most important boundary for me is, is life. There will always be work. There will always be projects. There will always be this and that, but we only get this life once and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be compromised or sacrificed for work. Um, so we have very generous like holiday policies here. We do fun retreats like to the Florida Keys. We, I, we really value the boundary between personal life and work. Um, and I certainly encourage any entrepreneur, women, men, unidentified, everybody to, to really just value your, your personal life. And that is so cool to hear from a lawyer at a law firm, because I think everyone, not everyone, I don't know, but a lot of people have that image in their head of like the movie lawyers, which work nonstop and they're available at like 1 a.m. in the morning and they're never sleeping and it's just crazy. So it's so, it's so good to hear that. And yeah. to have that that notion dispelled in my head <laughs> of a lawyer's life. I am trying to do things differently is what I say. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. So tell us, where can we find you? Your website, if you have any social media you want to share, anything like that, let us know. Yeah, so Schraibman Law, S-H-R-A-Y-B-M-A-N. And there's pretty much only one Schraibman in the world. So Schraibman Law, if you Google it, you will find our website, schraibmanlaw.com. We're Schraibman Law on LinkedIn. We're Schraibman Law on Instagram. Um, we're pretty easy to find as long as you spell it correctly. Why do um, law firms always just use the last name of whoever's leading it? Is that is that just because there's so many law firms? It's just the easiest way to do it? Or is it, do, it does it have some kind of origin history? Because it seems like, you know, most people use their last name. I mean, I'm sure it just started with like, I don't know, when like towns were small and, you know, it's just like the easiest way to find somebody by their name. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I went back and forth on that quite a bit when I was starting the firm. I was like, should I, you know, give it like a name, like a, you know, like a business name, something more creative um, but then I was like, eh, no, I'll just, I'll go the egocentric way and just name it after myself. I, I should look that up. This probably is something to do with like, just like being, I'm like imagining the small 1800s Western town where there's like one person on one side of the town, one on the other. And like, yeah. it's just distinguished yeah. by their like, names <laughs> and then it just continued through history. And... Yeah. 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 Um, so again, your, your philosophy mantra quote, since I always end with this is, Build work around life, not life around work. Is that it? Good. When it comes to Good. work, yeah, that's the motto. There, I also, my kind of personal life motto is break the stereotype, which is maybe also relevant to, to some of your listeners, whether you are a woman in a male dominant industry or whatever it might be, whatever stereotypes have been attached to whoever you are, what has been identified to how you exist, just break the stereotypes, whatever is expected, just screw the expectations. Oh, I like it. I like it. So Jessica, thank you so much for joining me on this interview. And if you're listening as an audience and you found this really informative and valuable, please do us a little favor and help grow the show. 
and find one person to share it with. And that would be mean the world to us. And you can find me on Instagram at virtuallycurie. And thank you, Jessica, again. Appreciate it. Thank you. So much fun.